It is uh, 7-11, and I'd like to call the Lexington City Council meeting to order the Thursday, October 7th uh, rendition, and um, thank you all for being here. Uh, first item of business is uh, if you'll all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you all very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is consideration of the agenda. There's been a request uh, by Mr. Smith to pull 9.5 from the consent agenda. And I would ask that that be heard um, just after we uh, vote on the consent agenda before unfinished business. We'll take that up for discussion and consideration unless there's an objection to doing so. Hearing none, we will accept the agenda as presented with that one modification. Uh, next, we'd like to go into uh, proclamations. <clears throat> and excited, uh, as usual, very excited for folks to be here and share for very positive things. Uh, Celia was not able to be with us this evening uh, due to um, in her words, uh, cranky, sleepless children, and um, has set Betty Beasel. And Betty, if you'll meet me at the dais uh, for a proclamation. And this is a proclamation establishing October 15, 2021, as Arbor Day in Lexington, Virginia. <clears throat> Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling cost, moderate the temperature, clean the air, sequester carbon, produce oxygen and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees planted along streams improve water quality and assist with flood control. And whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. Now, therefore, as mayor of Lexington in the great state of Virginia, I do hereby proclaim October 15 as Arbor Day in the city of Lexington. And I urge all citizens to join in Arbor Day activities and to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. And further, I urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Given uh, this uh, under the city seal, this uh, seventh day of October in the year of our Lord, 2021. Betty, uh, thank you for your work on the tree board, and please pass our thanks along to the entire tree board and Celia for the work that you all do, and look forward to celebrating uh, Friday, October 15th. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Hope to see you there. Fantastic. Thank you. Also, a proclamation declaring Thursday, October 14th is Children's Environmental Health Day in Lexington, Virginia. Whereas the aim of Children's Environmental Health, CEH, day is to raise awareness about the importance of clean air and water, safe food and consumer products, and healthy environments to children's health and development. And whereas CEH day was created by the Children's Environmental Health Network and celebrated for the first time on October 13, 2016. And whereas CEH Day is observed on the second Thursday in October as a means to celebrate progress of the children's environmental health movement and create a strong network of child health advocates. And whereas CEH Day is a national effort supported by individuals, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies. And whereas CEH Day encourages individuals and organizations to raise awareness and understanding of children's environmental health issues seek improved protection for all children, and to perform acts of sustainability and environmental health wellness. 
Uh, whereas together we can safeguard the health, safety, and well-being of our most precious resource, children. Therefore, I hereby proclaim Thursday, October 14th, 2021, as Children's Environmental Health Day in the city of Lexington, and urge all citizens to observe this day with awareness raising and environmental health and stewardship activities to create a healthier environment, environment for all our children. Um, and I offer this on behalf of uh, a grateful uh, council and city uh, focused on our children and appropriate given the uh, joint meeting with our school board earlier. Um, thank you all. Uh, next item on the agenda, we have no uh, presentations and we have no public hearings. Uh, next item would be consideration of the minutes which were distributed in your packet. And unless there's an objection from council, we can accept those or approve those as presented. They will stand approved. Uh, next item is citizens' remarks and comments. Uh, this is when we invite individuals who would like to uh, speak to council on items typically not on the agenda, if there's something uh, that you would like to speak to council about. Um, I'm not sure if we checked the sign. No one. Don't have anyone that signed up. Is there anyone who would like to speak to council this evening on items not on the agenda? Very good. Uh, we will close the citizens' remarks and move on to the consent agenda. And again, I will identify that uh, item 9.5 has been pulled and ask for council's consideration of the consent agenda presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Strong? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ziegler? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Alligood? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. A motion carries unanimously. And just, Mr. Mayor, uh, just, just briefly, the consent agenda called for closing a certain street on Lee Jackson Day. Just to clarify that that is no longer a holiday as of early 2020, uh, just for the good of the order, uh, didn't, just for the sake of accuracy, just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Mr. Sigler. Next item uh, is 9.5. It's a request by Donna Bearclaw for a street closure to host Halloween trick-or-treating on Jackson Avenue on Friday, October 29th, 2021. And I invite Ms. Bearclaw to come and speak or send your proxy of Amber, whomever would like to speak. And Amber, if you could state your name uh, and address for the record, please. Yes, of course. Uh, my name is Amber Amstead. I live on 306 Jackson Avenue. Um, and we're discussing the closure of Jackson Avenue. Um, so when we or originally requested our permit, we requested it for the Friday of October 29th. Uh, we did this because in the past we've always done our, held this event after Main Street Lexington trick-or-treat event. Uh, we saw it as basically uh, a convenience to uh, the children and the parents who partic to participate in the Main Street event because typically afterwards they would come down to Jackson and they would do a little more trick-or-treating into the evening. Um, it has come to my attention that uh, there has been some opposition to the permit. Um, and, uh, and so I did reach out to uh, some parents of young children who are strongly in support of doing such a thing, especially since a lot of our kids, mine included, has school the next day on Monday after Halloween. Uh, so giving our kids an opportunity on Saturday and Sunday to rest and kind of work out that sugar uh, would kind of be great for not only the parents, but the teachers who have to teach them on Monday. Uh, however, um, we are totally fine leaving the decision of changing the date of the permit up to city council. Uh, as we have done last year, uh, we allowed, we gave permission to city council to reserve the right to change the date in case of inclement weather. Uh, 
And so we're totally fine with that. What's important to us is that we continue to hold this tradition. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, it's something that has been going on since I first moved on to Jackson Street or at Jackson Avenue. It's also one of the reasons why uh, one of our neighbors decided to move to Jackson Avenue because it is a very special event. We love hosting it. Um, I would say that uh, Friday, if we maintain the day on Friday as, the, on, as uh, currently on the permit, if Friday happens to have a rainy day, then the council could move it to a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, so that might be a little more convenient for y'all. But what's the most important is not so much the date, it's just that it happens. This is a community event that we'd like to host for the community. And we are prepared to support the council and the community in whatever decision you uh, reach. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Appreciate you being here. And um, your enthusiasm for Halloween is infectious. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love it so much. Um, as uh, council members are aware, I received a, an email that you all were copied or uh, included. Uh, from Dr. Ramey, and he asked me to read it into the record, and I am um, not going to read it in, but it will be included in the minutes, as is our customary um, uh, uh, policy um, to not read everything that's sent to us, but distributed amongst council, and all of you have had the benefit of uh, Dr. Ramey's observations uh, related to this matter. Mr. Ayers. Um, yeah, on the, on the same subject, uh, I received an email from uh, uh, Jerry Nay on, on this subject, um, and uh, for the same reason of our new policy, I will provide it to Janie, and it'll be in our minutes. And somewhat for the record, both of those were um, encouraging council to uh, uh, not approve the Friday the 29th um, uh, festivity, but to hold it on Sunday the 31st. Very good. Um, would welcome council's consideration of uh, the request from the Bearclaws. I'll make a motion that we can start with. Uh, I move to approve the request for a street closure to host Halloween trick or treat on Jackson Avenue on Sunday, October 31st. Second. Thank you, Ms. Alexander, for the second. And uh, council members, Council Strawn. Do you, do you want to add a time to that? Uh, whatever was in the permit. Okay. Happened, yeah, and I'll just add, uh, I think a little bit of the confusion started with Main Street, Lexington, and the reason for Main Street having the trick-or-treat on Friday was that a lot of the businesses are closed on Sunday, and so they thought it would be better participation if we have it on Friday. And having been here for a long time. This has happened in the past. And I'll tell you, I, it is nice. It, Halloween is so special here. And it's, you know, the folks down on Jackson and, and that whole area that especially make it nice for being so welcoming to the whole community because it's not just Lexington. Uh, so I see it as, in the past as it has spread out the fun over a whole weekend, which I really enjoy. My only, you know, concern with having it on Friday is I do sympathize with the folks that worry about we're gonna end up having trick or treat twice. And I really do think that would be a problem. So I thank you for, for bringing up the permit. I do think it will work out better having it on the 31st, but I appreciate all your efforts and participation, whichever day we have it. Thank you, Ms. Strawn. Any other comments from members of council? Yeah, I have one. I also want to thank uh, the organizers of this event for all the effort that they put into it, and the city's very grateful for that. Um, I, I, I think, and while I'm fully supportive of, of closing the street this year, I, I do wonder, and, and it may be a topic for discussion in subsequent years, whether closing the street, I, I mean, my understanding is that we have done that for the past six years or so. And my understanding is that that the traffic and, and the number of children that come have has gotten a little unwieldy. And, and so I guess my question is, it, it, moving forward, not this year, but in future years, is it really necessary to close the street? 
Uh, that, that's kind of the question that I struggle with, and, and I, I, I feel like we need to give that some thought in future years, but, but not this year because we've planned to close the street. So that's where I am. I mean, council can always deny a street closure, but, but citizens oh. are now able to always petition. It seems now there's also on the consent agenda, there was another street closure for a social event. At July 4th, there was a street closure for a social event, a private one. So now it's just a thing that citizens do. As a parent of kids, I do believe, though, that it is incredibly nice and beneficial to have that street closure. And really what, what always happened was Halloween was on the 31st. And to make the 31st, to make Halloween safe, we closed that street. Now, all of a sudden, people have started to think that the street closure has to happen first so that that dictates when Halloween is. And maybe, as I've said, as Brenda Garten, our interim city manager, recommended in writing that we take this out of citizens' hands and at Halloween, since it's on the 31st, that's what we do and the street is closed. And, and, and because we've had, unfortunately, we've had citizens attempting to good, do good deeds uh, not realize that they happen to be making some of their neighbors upset. I've received more emails about Halloween than about just about any other issue. And I just feel bad that that's what it's come to because my kids will trick or treat whenever I tell them to. And it's, it's parents and, and neighbors that are trying to do right by their kids, at the end of the day, we want it to be safe. So this is a good outcome, but for the love of God, we need to quit allowing citizens to put this permit in and let us just close the street for safety reasons on Halloween. We've said we would do that, and yet we haven't done it for the last few years. Um, I reached out to uh, one of our former city managers as to when exactly we did start closing uh, Jackson Avenue and his recollection while not you know precise was about 10 years ago was when we uh, started uh, barricading Jackson Avenue in the interest of public safety because Halloween on Jackson had gotten to the point where um, the, the necessity of, of restricting traffic uh, what was uh, that we, we reached finally reached that point and as a result I believe since then uh, the expectation has been annually to barricade Jackson Avenue on Halloween being the 31st. Um, and and I've, historically, I believe that's, that's how we've gotten to the point where we are. Um, and again, moving forward, there, we can have uh, discussions on, on direction of policy making for street closures because we are seeing more and more and more requests for street closures and the load that it puts on city staff, as far as, um, you know, police, uh, fire and rescue uh, requirements. The more and more requests we have for street closures, it becomes more and more uh, complicated and expensive to uh, make these events happen. I like these events, I really do. Jackson Avenue on, on Halloween is a circus. Um, the, the folks I know that, the adults I know that get dressed up for this event, uh, they really, <laughs> they really embrace it and, it, and it's great to see that kind of participation, not from just the children, but from the adults that, that want to participate just as much. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we can, can, can reach an agreement that, uh, that we've reached uh, f for Sunday, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and as we move forward, we can talk about some of the other things. Thank you. Ms. Alexander. Yes, I just want to talk gen uh, in general about when we close streets and need the police department. And our local police department is spread pretty thin right now. So we're going to have to be very cognizant of what we approve and how much manpower an event is going to cost the police department. I will say, I, I, maybe I made the point inelegantly, but what I was trying to say was that, that, that I think possibly the, 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 the Jackson Avenue event has expanded the way it has because we've closed the street. I, you, you disagree with that? It's been huge anyway. I mean, I do think yeah. it's a good safety measure. And 
and be part of it. There was some truth about being able to get emergency vehicles through if that were needed, because people would drop off their kids and drive down the street and watch their kid trick or treat. It was, <laughs> but but this works out great, and I really appreciate Jackson and all the streets participating. Yeah. I'm mindful that Main Street Lexington, when it first started trick or treating downtown, the street was not closed. But again, in the name of public safety, I think there was one year we had cadets on every corner to help the children cross. Um, and so it, a victim of success and lots of people showing up and it just gets to the point where you gotta shut it down, um, shut down the street in the name of safety for the children. And one thing, um, I, I think through the conversations over the past couple days, um, I, I'm gonna look to the city attorney because I, I think this has come up. Um, by code, the city manager is responsible, city council, somewhat is interfering or trumping the, the responsibility of the city manager with these street closures. They, they should be an administrative task by code. Yes, I, the city code is, is, and state code, it's delegated to the administrative office, officer of the municipality and at the state level, and then the city code specifically says it's the city manager's role to close streets and give some of those powers. And I've, I think I took the position basically that when we take these votes to approve the, um, the closure is that that city council sort of um, giving an advisory opinion to the city manager on what is and what is not proper. Um, so to that extent, it's more sort of providing advice and direction to the city manager, but ultimately it, the, the authority rests with the city manager. Which is what we saw in um, 2019, I think it was when it was moved because of the threat of a, a significant and dangerous storm. So just so that we all understand the roles and responsibilities as we progress on this and, and, and embrace our fund. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I'd ask for a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Ayers. Aye. Ms. Strawn. Aye. Mr. Ziegler. Aye. Mr. Alligood. Aye. Ms. Alexander. Aye. Motion carries unanimously and look forward to uh, partying on Jackson Avenue from 5.30 to 8 p.m. on Halloween Sunday. Um, thank you, Barrett Kloss, and uh, good luck. Uh, and wish your neighbors good luck for all the, the ghosts and goblins. Hope a lot more uh, treats than tricks. Uh, next item on the agenda is unfinished business, uh, and we have none that I'm aware of. Would move uh, directly into reports and communications and Blue Ridge Resource Authority, Mr. Smith. Well, briefly, the Blue Ridge Resource Authority Advisory Committee met on uh, on Monday. We haven't had the, our full board meeting will be on uh, uh, next Monday. And uh, but during the discussion, uh, we're we're coming up on a, a, a pretty tight timeline of when cell one. Uh, closes and when cell two will be ready for um, landfill uh, deposit solid waste and um, one idea that's being floated um, is to sort of do a temporary closure of cell one which leaves uh, some room for extra landfill deposit once we see some compaction uh, in cell one so we can load some more trash in cell one which will also lighten the load a little bit uh, for uh, for cell two, cell two construction uh, should be finished toward the end of November, and uh, the cell one fill date looks like it's going to be around uh, end of January. So our, our window between closing and opening is is running fairly tight, um, but um, that's the the current situation there. We're also in contract negotiations with. Uh, with a firm for gas and uh, and water monitoring for for the future and see what cost savings might be uh, involved there. Any questions? For those of you marking your schedules and uh, making arrangements, uh, our meeting will actually be on Tuesday the twelfth. Uh, Monday's a uh, holiday. Right. Correct. <clears throat> Tuesday the twelfth. Thank you, Chuck. Main Street Lexington, Miss Strong. In case you hadn't heard, the annual downtown trick-or-treat event will be Friday, October 29th from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. downtown. It will be held on Friday because many of the downtown businesses are closed on Sunday. And that's all I have for Main Street, unless there's any questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Strong. Planning Commission. The Planning Commission met on Thursday, September 23rd. We unanimously approved an entrance corridor application by Brian Torrance for new signs for the Lexington Pancake House at 463 East Nelson Street. We also unanimously approved an entrance corridor application for new signs for the Ugly Doug's Deli, which is at 453 East Nelson Street, and it is now open. So if you get a chance, go by both those establishments. They're owned by the same owner, and they're pretty much back, back, back from each other. You know, the Pancake House is behind where Cookout is, and this is right next to Cookout. Is this uh, the former Uptown Smoothie? Yes, exactly. Okay. Right, that same space. The and I have to say, his sign is one of the best signs I've seen <laughs> since being on Planning Commission. It's very creative. The uh, Planning Commission continued discussion of the small cell text amendments. And in case you missed it in the most recent water bill, there was this little insert. Uh, there's a link to give input for the bike and pedestrian plan. And as you know, the city of Lexington recently won a grant for assistance to create a bike and, pe and pedestrian plan. As a city with two universities and a walkable downtown environment, there's a ready-made population eager to take advantage of safer and more comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And we need your input to make sure we are focusing on the right areas. Please take a couple of minutes to interact with the survey tool and leave feedback if you are so inclined. You can go to the newly renovated, updated city website, which is lexingtonva.gov, and click on the government tab and then city projects, and then there's a tab for Lexington Bike and Pedestrian Plan. Please share the link with every, anyone you think might be interested or have valuable suggestions. And the survey will remain open through the end of October. It's a really neat survey tool because it maps out, you get to you know, point out where you think there's some uh, areas that could have improvement, and you write comments, and you can read what everybody else's comments are. So it's really an interesting tool, and I think it'll be very valuable in putting together the bike and ped plan. And that's all it, I is that being distributed to uh, other organizations as well? The link? Uh, yes. Uh, we're just trying to get it out best we can. I, I'm not sure who all Arnie has sent it, but again, it was in the water bill. It's on the website, and tell everybody you know. So, saw it today, and the, the link was, or the... The type is small, but uh, I, I almost missed it. But yeah, and the um, best best way is going to the city website. That is right. definitely the easiest. Go, go to the government tab on it, and then uh, city plans and projects, and you can see bike and ped plan. Just uh, 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 ho hopefully get out to all the right people that are involved in such things and uh, right. can have some input. It's always terrible to have a survey and not have. Um, uh, for instance, the master planners at Washington and Lee not participate. Um, right, and I, I do believe it's gone to our uh, uh, green infrastructure group, which has really good representation. Terrific. Interest in this type of thing. Thank you very much. Regional tourism, Mr. Ayers. Um, yeah, um, uh, we're not going to meet again until the 13th, but um, a couple items. Um, First off, we've got word from CenturyLink that all that HVAC equipment um, that's been taking up half of the Lexington Visitor Center's parking lot for the past few months will be hauled off early next week, possibly as early as Monday. So that's a bit of good news. Um, uh, Regional Tourism this weekend is hosting travel riders with Blue Ridge Mountain Travel Guide. Um, they'll be here through Saturday. Um, Natural Bridge State Park tonight is holding their Dark, Spy, Dark Sky Park dedication in their interactive classroom that began at 6.30 this evening, so unfortunately you missed it. Um, Friends of uh, the Chessy um, Marathon, which takes place on October 30th, already has 300 runners registered so far, which is a, a bumper crop. Uh, if you're interested in participating, Google Run the Chessy to pull up the event sign-up form. The event includes a marathon, a half marathon, a 5K, as well as a marathon relay race, which is new this year. Um, in other trail news, South River Bridge on the Chessy Trail is still on track to be completed early December. And uh, finally, um, Tourism's Marketing Director Patty Williams and I, along with a number of regional rep representatives, including my colleague Chuck Smith and Mayor Friedman, uh, attended a breakfast at the Virginia Horse Center on Wednesday this week. Uh, the purpose of the breakfast was to meet with Congressman Ben Klein and Congressional Agricultural Committee's ranking member G.T. Thompson to discuss and solicit input for the fiscal year 2023-28 Farm Bill. 
and that was a very interesting breakfast. Um, and that is everything I have. Any questions for Mr. Ayers? Thank you, Dennis. Or Chuck, go ahead. I was going to say, just uh, after that programming, we, we did get a brief tour around the Horse Center and, and got to see some of the improvements that are being made out there. Uh, one of the barns has been uh, completely redone with new uh, new LED lighting. The pathways, or the pathway between the uh, some of the barns has been uh, regraded and repaved. Uh, they put in some some rubber tiles or rubber bricks uh, to help with with horse traction, so they're not slipping on on uh, normally normal glazed bricks. Uh, much better drainage. Uh, and after that, we took a ride up to McCormick Farm in Rafine and uh, saw some of the um, innovations that uh, Virginia Tech in that extension uh, is putting in place um, to make farming more efficient and more green, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, also, uh, if you haven't been up to the McCormick Farm in a while, uh, I would suggest going up there. It's just we we kind of get not stuck here in Lexington, but we have a we don't get to the further reaches of of the county uh, maybe as much as we as we should. So just a reminder: if, if you get the opportunity while you're up in that that region, if you're hit the hitting the Rockbridge Vineyard and Brewery, uh, instead of turn left, turn right, go hit the farm, uh, and then go uh, slake your thirst. Or if you get hungry, stop by Quaker Steak and Lube. In uh, 40 years of trucking, Bobby will show you a good time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Rockbridge Area Recreation Organization, Mr. Ziegler. Uh, our board of directors met last night. We met uh, for several hours over at the Macaulay Pavilion at the uh, Vista Links. Um, our new executive director talked about some of the exciting things that are happening. We had that fall in love with Raro Day uh, recently, we, and we had about 200 kids participate. We had the VMI baseball team participate and the VMI basketball team there. And then Lexington, uh, the police department, the fire department, and, and EMS all participated. And it seemed like a lot of folks had a good time. A um, couple things going on. Uh, our football teams are doing pretty well this, this fall. And there was, a, there was a night last week, uh, just, I mean, all the nights are fun that we have night games, but there was a night last week at, at Camden Field that they just said it was just a special night. There were so many people there that the parking lot was overflowing and there were people parking on the streets. And I think it was just a really great community event. And that was the night that Lexington and Buena Vista teams were playing against each other and it was exciting. And uh, because of the success of some of our local teams are that that we're going to be hosting playoff games. And you might remember that we play against teams over in Allegheny County, Covington and, and Clifton Forge areas. And so we're actually doing really well. So then we're going to host uh, the playoff games, and we actually get to host the Super Bowl this year in that, in that league because we're a member of that league and we're getting to host, which is, again, super exciting for our kids and a testament to our coaches. Um, a, a change that folks that have had kids that have participated in RARO, something uh, that our executive director proposed. Uh, we're going to modify some of our terminology. Uh, for a long time, we've been intro, we've been mighty mites, and then junior and senior. Mighty mites has always left a lot of people scratching their heads, unsure what that meant. Uh, and we're just going to modify that and call them rookies. We're going to still have intro, we're going to go to rookie, and then junior and senior. And we just think that that's a little bit more self-explanatory uh, to people that they're not sure what a mite is is or what a mighty might is. Um, and then, you know, I just, um, one thing that was shared with us by the executive director was how much we rely on the localities uh, to help maintain fields. And specifically, they really wanted to uplift the city of Lexington. There's a lot of grass to cut in the city on the fields that we use. And the city of Lexington is very responsive and helps maintain the fields to allow the RARO staff uh, on their field duties of just to worry about marking fields, so they take care of the dirt on our diamonds and so forth. But a lot of the mowing is done uh, as scheduled when it's needed by Lexington City Public Works and that we felt that that should be acknowledged and we really appreciate that. So please share that with, with the Public Works team, Jim. And then we did elect our new chairman, but it's not going to be a new chairman. We are making Joey Jones do it again. I think it's his third or fourth year that we're making him do that. And I think uh, that means that I'm the vice chair for, I think, my fifth year in a row. Uh, I just can't make it 
over that hump. No. Uh, so Joey does a great job, and the whole region is served well by Joey serving as chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Ziegler. Any questions? Hearing none, Ms. Alexander Threshold. Thank you. On September 22nd, Threshold was charged with discussing the planning of the seminar on affordable housing and a partnership with Planning Commission. Mr. Charles Familliner, uh, the retired HUD director of Richmond Field Office, um, I believe he retired probably around 2010, 2012-ish, and he's currently chairman of the board of the Community Housing Partners in Montgomery County, will speak on the basics of affordable housing, what to expect when you venture into the funding aspects of subsidized in the subsidized housing world right now. And his main topic will be on housing cost overburden as it relates to the burdens of families of, uh, who have to pay rents that are supposed to be affordable and they really are not, uh, even in the affordable housing industry. Um, we want to make sure that members of IDA, our jurisdictions, other local housing partners are made aware through the various announcements and media sources that we will we'll use to announce when this is going to be. Threshold also discussed the direction of the organization um, as to becoming housing advocates for this area versus being project-based as in the past. And we'll continue uh, talking about that at our next meeting. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. Any questions for Ms. Alexander? Ms. Strong. I'll ask one, and it might be premature. I know when we talked in Planning Commission about the threshold presentation, we figured there would be a lot of interest in it. Did you, you didn't decide on a format. We talked maybe about doing it virtually uh, to, to be able to reach out to more people. I've, I've heard about, about it both ways, possibly having it here or doing it on Zoom. So I don't know what the final is, because I've heard that we're going to do it here, and then I heard we're going to do Zoom. So I think that Arnie is working that out with Mr. Familiner and will let us know actually a, a date as well as a location. Thank you, Mrs. Alexander. Maury Service Authority, Mr. Alligood. Thank you. The Maury Service Authority monthly board meeting was held the last Tuesday. Uh, of uh, September and during that meeting uh, we uh, heard some budget estimates for what it would take to repair the wastewater uh, generator problem which is getting uh, more acute and uh, the uh, acute to the point where uh, it puts the operation in jeopardy if it's not repaired. And of course, that's a major thing because it's the only one we've got uh, for servicing our system. Uh, additionally, uh, the major rain event that happened uh, a week or so ago uh, was uh, such an extent, the volume of the rainfall was an exceptional and high level that it overwhelmed the pumps at the pumping station to the point where it was very questionable whether the pumps could keep up. And then Providence stepped in and the rainfall abated somewhat and the pumps kept up, but it was highly questionable whether that was going to happen had the rainfall continued. And then that would have caused uh, having to bypass and go straight to the Maury River when everything is full, which then brings into the uh, question uh, water quality. Uh, but the Maury Service Authority so far has met the water quality standards uh, that uh, have been set by the state of Virginia. Uh, the next meeting for the modernization of the water treatment uh, of the uh, water plant, not the water treatment, but the water plant is set for this coming Tuesday. And uh, I, I listened to the Blue Ridge meeting is going to now not be Monday, but Tuesday. Uh, we're in the 
Rockbridge County Administration Building scheduled for five o'clock. Uh, at this is is your meeting scheduled for seven? Our meeting's at seven. Yes. Okay. So so we'll have to rush through ours uh, to uh, get through with it. But for interested folks, uh, we're, you're welcome to come and listen to the part two of what it's going to take financially and equipment wise to modernize the water plant. Currently estimates are ranging in the vicinity of $20 million. Now that money is split, will be split between the county and the city uh, in terms of who pays for what, but it'll necessarily be uh, 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 it'll result in higher rates and bond payments. So part two, this coming Tuesday, five o'clock at the Rockbridge administration uh, uh, meeting room. Uh, you might be fighting for microphones with, uh, with the supervisors that night. It's upstairs, That's what I was thinking. Is, the, is your meeting upstairs in the, in the extension office? It, it was to be in the meeting room. The downstairs. Well, yeah. uh, there, there's a meeting room upstairs as well, sometimes referred to as the meeting room as opposed to the Board of Supervisors room. So you won't be too far with either, either one. Either way. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't know the answer, but obviously we'll take second fiddle to the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> Indeed. We'll right. see how much traction Jay Lewis is going right. to going up and down the steps. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Jay Lewis is on the Board of Supervisors as well as on the MSA board. Thank you, Mr. Alligood. Any other questions for Mr. Alligood? Uh, under my report, I have a couple of items. Um, number one, just to remind myself and uh, council members as well, our um, policy, if you will, as I mentioned earlier, when we receive letters uh, or communications from uh, members of the public, uh, to share those amongst council. It's not the ambition or intention to read those at our uh, public meetings, but include them in the minutes for um, consistency and for information to be shared. So uh, uh, please be sure if you do receive, uh, for instance, Sherry Nay sent that to all of council, so everyone has seen it, and the, those will both be um, in, in the minutes. Um, had the chance to attend the VML conference. If you haven't had the opportunity in the past, I uh, encourage you to, to get involved with VML. Um, it's a good organization, and um, the, the camaraderie and the topics and what have you are, um, are very beneficial. The conference was in Leesburg and was a terrific conference. It was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, grants and money, are uh, they abound. Jim Regimbold uh, declared, who's one of the speakers, um, he said he's never seen the money flying like he is right now in his 30-plus uh, year career. Um, he said, uh, for those looking to forecast after the past year that we went through with the pandemic, forget about it. it it's improbable to, uh, to forecast um, what revenues will be and, and where we go from here. Um, he also included in, in his review the state priorities, if you follow the money, um, huge cash, um, a huge portion of it is going to the unemployment fund, which was significantly uh, tapped into in, in 2020, uh, to broadband, specifically rural broadband. I think it's uh, an entirety $850 million. 150 million was originally appropriated, and then the governor put $700 million, um, which was he just shaking his head, and um, for those of you who know Jim Regimbold, he was um, just blown away. Uh, K through 12, and then um, eviction services and support. Uh, those were the most heavily funded with the, the current surplus uh, at the state level. And then because of um, calculations that I won't get into, um, a certain percentage uh, overage of revenues being over a certain percentage for a certain period um, kicks in and a portion of that, a certain percentage of that has to go into the rainy day fund. So uh, that, that's good news of sorts. Um, <clears throat> there were lots of conversations and uh, uh, some of the 
topic, uh, topical breakouts were about uh, ARP money uh, and ways that that could be used. Um, the different municipalities, uh, it, it, it's mind-boggling how some communities are interpreting the use of that. And um, instead of doing things transformational, which I anticipate this council doing, um, we're just writing checks to uh, local businesses and um, entities and nonprofits and just turning the money loose in the community. Um, and not really focusing, I guess they have no infrastructure problems, which uh, we do. One of the other uh, breakouts that I went to was looking at EV infrastructure, and it was hosted by Dominion. Dominion has a fleet of 8,600 vehicles, and by 2030, they anticipate 75% of their passenger vehicles uh, being electric, and 50% of their bucket trucks, uh, work trucks, and uh, four-wheelers that they utilize in their service, 50% uh, will be electric again by 2030 is the goal that they're striving for. Uh, unbelievable amount of conversation about who's responsible for the infrastructure. Um, lots of municipalities saying, you know, how do we budget for this? How do we afford it? And uh, Dominion was pretty good about saying, and, and Jim Regenbolt was in this one as well, saying um, you're not telling sheets where to put their gas tanks and not funding that infrastructure. So this is for the private sector to figure out, but make sure you have the proper policies for EV hookups and things of that nature. Uh, there's also a, a great um, breakout on the Marcus Alert. Um, I was not familiar with it. If you're not aware, it's uh, the state's initiative for dealing with uh, predominantly mental health issues. If you don't know, uh, if you're in a mental health um, uh, crisis, uh, 911 is not the number for you to call. Uh, 988 is a new hotline set up statewide uh, for helping people in mental health crises. Um, it's being rolled out. Uh, Arlington was presenting. They're one of the uh, test uh, folks. Um, it's going to line up with the Community Services Board um, uh, around the state. Ours is of the size. It, it's so small. Uh, we'll be one of the last to implement. But um, because it's, in essence, 911 for uh, mental health. And it'll be a whole different um, venue, operation, and the whole nine yards. Um, and uh, the other piece that I thought was uh, very important and a great reminder is that um, of all the industries in the United States, there's only one that did not close down when uh, the pandemic hit, and that was um, local government. Uh, trash was picked up, the water continued to flow, uh, people had their electricity and, and what have you, so um, kudos and compliments from uh, these industry leaders uh, talking about um, uh, public works and, and local government uh, carrying the torch and moving forward, so um, all to be congratulated. Uh, as you may uh, have identified, um, we have a vacancy on the Community Services Board. We want to wish uh, Alicia Bostic well. She's moving to Boston, I understand. Uh, Third-hand information, but her departure creates an opening, and I think you all received a letter from Kim Shaw of um, her observations of uh, what a, a member might be. We do have one application, but encourage folks, if they have an interest, to uh, apply so that we have a variety of people um, that preferably have experience with the Community Service Board programming. And um, as a last piece, I don't know if any of you have received uh, this handbook uh, for Virginia mayors and council members, the 2021 edition. Um, great information, a couple things I wanted to, to share with you very briefly. Um, when you look at it, one of the authors um, and, and major contributors is Kim Payne, who's a Lexington uh, native, who also worked with us some uh, when Noah Simon was our uh, city manager and was a former city manager in um, uh, Lynchburg and then helped with our search that uh, found Jim to be our city manager. But uh, the couple of pieces I wanted to share, um, reminder, uh, goals of city council meetings. Um, goal number one is to make good public policy. Number two, to adjudicate community values, uh, which we did a little bit of uh, this evening. Uh, goal three, engage and educate citizens. Goal four, uh, burnish reputation and brand. And goal five, build trust. 
uh, and I'm elated to uh, declare and observe and congratulate all of you uh, on working towards those and accomplishing those, I think, at all of our meetings. And lastly, one of the things um, when we began, uh, or as we begin each year, and we talk about um, our code of ethics and what have you, um, one of the uh, items that I've uh, often asked and um, uh, shared as a goal of my personal um, uh, perspective is to, for council to speak as one voice so that there's great clarity for our city manager to be as effective as he can be. And uh, it cannot be overemphasized how important it is for local government council to function as a team. And again, I'm grateful we don't agree on everything, but we're able to have uh, robust discussions. And when a vote's taken, we uh, all get behind it and move forward for the uh, betterment of our citizens. So thank you for the good work that you do. Unless there are any questions, I'll uh, pass it to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll leave my mask on if that can be heard clearly. Uh, for a number of meetings now, I've been talking about Columbia Gas, and we can still see they're still working here in Lexington. I do understand, though, they will be making cutovers from their new lines, in, or the old lines, to the new lines very soon and putting in the service lines that are necessary. So we are seemingly nearing an end. I understand that by the middle of November, they should be repaving uh, and doing a good job of repaving all the uh, holes they put in the streets, the, the pits and the, and the long uh, trenches in various streets. So we'll watch that carefully, but that seems to be where we're headed at this point in time. Uh, on the finance front, I think we've all understood that for several months we've been without uh, both our assistant finance director Tommy Roberts and Jake Adams our finance director a former finance director and we've uh, done the best we could there we hired Heidi Reynolds a wonderful young lady to be our assistant finance director an in-house transfer if you will and then this week we did hire Jennifer Bell to be our permanent finance director I, I got a lot of good feedback from city staff had a <clears throat> very good team on the finance on the uh, search team and the interview team, and uh, they all thought Jennifer was an excellent candidate and fit for the city, and I took that information and recommendation wholeheartedly, so very happy to have Jennifer with us. A uh, few updates from the fire department. Um, like a lot of things today, there's changes, and we've seen some pretty significant growth in the call volume of the fire department throughout the last year. I wouldn't say that's COVID-related by any means, but things have changed. Uh, this past uh, week, First week in October, in the first three days, we had 58 calls, which is twice the average calls that we normally have in that time frame. So uh, we're just seeing a lot of business. It's probably not good business, although they're coming to help. Uh, they are responding to you know, very difficult situations and emergencies, and, and we just try and do our best, and the staff does a great job in those situations. Uh, one of the other things we've seen recently that's unusual is uh, diversions at Carilion Hospital, meaning that the hospital cannot take in any additional patients. The first one happened in the middle of September and we had another one just this last Sunday night. At that point in time, our local fire and rescue crews know that if they have somebody in an ambulance, they have to take them to another hospital. So we are staffing up when that happens to be sure that we have people that can be in the ambulance going to Augusta County or Lynchburg and still have staff on hand and ambulances on hand to respond to the next call. So that does create some other stresses for the department. The department and the uh, Rockbridge department and chief are working with the hospital to coordinate those activities better. Should it happen again, of course, nobody would like those uh, activities to occur again, but it's just something that has occurred. My understanding is not COVID related. It's a, um, a variety of causes at this point. COVID doesn't help anything, but it's not traced to that. It's just maybe more business and fewer staff and a number of other issues as well. Um, earlier this month, uh, some of you may have seen, but uh, the local departments being Glasgow, Buena Vista, Rockbridge County, and our own department provided an honor display on I-81 for Staff Sergeant Ryan Naus who was killed with 12 other, 12 other service members in Afghanistan in August, and Staff Sergeant Naus was being taken to Arlington for internment. So they did a very nice display over I-81, honoring him as he progressed to Arlington Cemetery. Uh, Chief Dickerson and other local public safety staff are participating in the build-out of the new SOMA 
computer-aided design, uh, dispatch and records management system. Uh, you recall that we just purchased the system regionally for our 911 center, and so the staff of police, fire, and other public safety agencies are involved in making sure everything that ne is necessary in that system gets put into that new system information-wise and um, technology-wise. Uh, in the DPW, senior staff have begun to review plans for the Jackson Area Water and Sewer Replacement Project. Uh, even though we're working in Diamond Hill right now, uh, we're also gearing up for the Jackson Street Phase 1, which will be upon us in about two years. Uh, good news and bad news if time rushes on and, and we move towards the next project even before we finished this project. Um, and on the note of this project, the uh, work is going very well on Diamond Hill. Um, they are on Massey Street now with both water and sewer replacement. Uh, spoke with um, Councilmember Alexander earlier tonight and she said that things are moving pretty well there. Not too many complaints. It's a congested area. Not a lot of parking. The streets are narrow. I was out talking to the contractor today as well and they said the same thing. So far things have been going fairly well. And haven't hit too much rock, although there's rock everywhere and they've, uh, they've, they've run into some, it's not been too difficult. So keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully that work will continue smoothly. Uh, from the police department, the uh, department interviewed candidates for the civilian uh, parking enforcement position recently, and they're doing the background check on the candidate now. So hopefully very soon they will have somebody in there, uh, civilian, taking care of that activity that once had been covered by a certified uh, police officer. So we could put our certified staff on the street doing something other than writing parking tickets. So that's a step in the right direction. Uh, Chief Green has been working with the VMI and the School Diversity Office to put in place a comprehensive diversity training program that would be both for VMI and city law enforcement staff. It's envisioned that community input will be incorporated into this diversity training program. So another uh, really positive step forward for both the department and the community. Uh, Chief's Green leadership in that and her co collaboration with um, VMI are really essential that, to make that happen. On September 30th, the department claim, completed a community walk in the Thornhill Road neighborhood and the only input really received there was to watch out for speeding in the area. So patrols were increased in that area and the uh, speed radar trailer has been stationed there and will be from time to time just to watch that area of the community. Um, frankly, I think from time to time we hear from most residents on most streets that they're speeding. Uh, there may be some and we want to try and uh, reduce that, but it's I think a common perception that on my street cars go too fast. Uh, but we'll try and uh, do what we can in any situation to make sure that those streets are safe. Um, also recently, another piece of good news, Officer Donovan Lewis completed departmental field training. And so now he's actively patrolling a solo out in the community, fully uh, certified and trained to be a, a law enforcement professional on our, our force. Um, I think we've all heard that uh, over the past few weeks, a number of catalytic converters have been stolen throughout the city and the county. We recently heard that another eight were reported stolen from our local repair business. At this time, there have been 18 stolen in the city that we know of and 60 in the county. And as an interesting note, almost all those thefts occurred at facilities who store their vehicles for a long period of time, unlocked, unsecured, no camera, and they don't track how long they've been there. So we can't even tell when the theft occurred because the vehicles have sat for weeks at a time and they go to check them and lo and behold, the catalytic converters are missing. So we're doing our best out there working with Rockbridge County Sheriff and other law enforcement agencies, have some leads, but um, you know, uh, the businesses also have to make sure they secure their sites to give us a little bit of help on things like this. Um, I think we've talked about this before as well, the Lee Avenue water line, and um, we do continue to hear questions and concerns about when are we gonna repave, I say water line, but the street and the water line breaks. When are, we gonna, when are we gonna repave Lee Avenue? We're not going to repave it. We do have to go ahead and get into that area again in a couple of years for the Jackson Avenue project or Jackson area project. If we were to repave the street today, we'd be tearing it back up in two years. Now we will do major repairs to those very large, um, holes and trenches that were placed in when we cut over the old line and the customers on that old line to the new line. And that will be done in November when our street uh, resurfacing contractor comes back in to finish up the small uh, repaving projects here in town. And that will be dealt with that, that time as well. 
I know residents in that area and some of the other areas of the community would love to see it completely paved, but that would just be throwing money in a pit and we'd open that pit back up in a couple of years and, and the money would be gone. So um, that's where we stand on that issue. Hope for some patience there and as we all experience on our streets, as repairs are made, there are some, there's some time period when we're not able to drive on streets or experience streets as nice as we'd like. And that is my report, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Was I mumbling too much? No, we can hear you clearly. I didn't know if uh, you wanted to, David to give a report on our ARP budget surplus meeting. P please, I, I, I thought time. that would be happening, yes. Uh, just, just very briefly, uh, Leslie, myself, Jim, Jennifer, we met uh, the other day and we talked briefly about the general surplus, but as soon as the four of us were in the meeting, Chief Dickerson came into the meeting and we looked at each other and we knew what direction that our meeting was going to take. And so uh, this is something that's been on the horizon, been discussed about, and this is what I'm just offering tonight is kind of a preview. The city manager and the finance director will come forward uh, with more thorough recommendations for all of us to consider. But right now, um, it, it looks like we'll have about a $1.5 million budget surplus from the closure of, of FY21. And of that, um, at least $800,000 is what we would like to put towards equipment replacement fund because it is time to make a new order for a ladder truck. And we've known about that for years. Chief Dickerson can explain that, but I wanted to share that with you each tonight so that you can be thinking about that and that when Chief Dickerson comes and shares that information more thoroughly with us, maybe at our next meeting. But um, you know, a new, new ladder truck could cost upwards of $1.6 million, and it's probably a lead time of 24 months to get it if the order was placed now. Uh, and, and so Chief Dickerson can explain this all more clearly than I can, but we just thought it was very important to give you that preview of our, from the, that came out of our meeting, uh, just, I guess that was yesterday. So that, that's really what I wanted to share. Uh, so you can take that home and, and think about that. But it's, it's on the horizon. The, the true recommendations from Jim and, and Jennifer about what to do with that, with that budget surplus. But equi uh, equipment replacement fund will be a large part of it. In part of the discussion, we can certainly ask the chief when he's here, but um, did you all get granular in talking about fundraising efforts support from um, obviously the local factories of Washington Lee and VMI, but also uh, foundations and other folks that can help with the uh, underwriting of this uh, piece of equipment? We did. We, we, that, that will be part of the equation, hopefully. Um, it has been in the past, and we hope that it will be going, going into the future. Uh, but again, Chief Dickerson, Jim, Jennifer are going to be much better at explaining this, this plan uh, and the need uh, but at, at the end of the day, none of us are surprised by this. We've been hearing about this for, for years. And so I uh, just wanted to kind of preview that tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you for making the time uh, to work on the ARP funds and its future along with the surplus. Uh, any other questions for the city manager? Um, I guess not a, not a question, but I guess addressing... Uh, some a uh, couple things that happened or happened that were discussed early this evening. One, educating the citizens uh, uh, about uh, now that we have decided that Halloween will be traditionally on Sunday, and the previous <sighs> evolution of expectation that Jackson Avenue Halloween will be following the Main Street trick or treating. I am encouraging uh, to educate our citizenry in whatever means possible that Jackson Avenue trick, trick or treating will be happening on Sunday and not happening on Friday to eliminate any confusion as we move forward that that is in fact the, the night that we'll be doing that. And through the city, through Main Street, through the chamber, through social media, through whatever, I want to make certain that there's no confusion on when that event will happen at it being the 31st. Um, the second is talking about our Lexington police force um, in, in an attempt to, um, I guess, take into the circumstances of 
a person on Main Street uh, last weekend that was under some influence of, of uh, recreational substances um, in some of the conversations that I've had with our officers and uh, that the fact that they're short staffed and the fact that they're dealing with a whole new set of problems that they've had to deal with over the last five years. Um, I encourage uh, anyone and everyone to go out of their way to thank them for the service that they provide for this community. Um, they, they can't hear it enough and sometimes we, we know the role and support that they provide for this community and but going, you know, just taking an extra step to say thank you, especially under some of the circumstances that they're dealing with right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Any other council members have statements, observations? Uh, hearing none, call on the city attorney. Any report? Just have a few quick items, um, sort of to preview things that'll be upcoming. There is a op another yet another opioid settlement that you need to approve. Hopefully, approve a resolution um, authorizing us to participate in. Um, that'll be coming up either our next meeting or the first meeting in November. But it's another one of these sort of subsets of cases that are settling. Um, and basically, will be the same process that we've talked about before. Um, but this will, you know, we've set up the bucket to contain the funds and the process for distributing it. This will just be authorizing us to, um, or voting to approve more money coming into the bucket. So um, we'll be, should be pretty straightforward. Um, other hopefully straightforward resolutions, I'm working with Chief Green to revise, review and revise the uh, memorandum or the mutual aid agreements with the VMI police force and the Buena Vista police force. Um, so we're pretty far along in that, but those do need to be approved by resolution of city council before uh, the respective chiefs can sign that. So that'll be coming up. Um, sort of depends on when we hear back from VV, but I would think either at the next meeting or the first meeting in November. Uh, and then not necessarily for council's attention, but one other thing I think uh, nice to note is I'm working with Chief Green. She's working with um, VMI engineering department and Jeff Martone on um, essentially the VMI engineering students uh, coming up with designs for obstacles and things at the skate park um, to design, build, put those in there under ultimately Jeff's supervision as a professional engineer. Um, I'm handling sort of the liability issues to make sure VMI is covered uh, from any sort of liability that they might um, be faced with. Uh, but so the city will be basically saying we'll, we'll take care of anything that gets uh, installed and uh, hopefully I think that project Jim might know more specifically on sort of timelines but um, hopefully I would think in the next few weeks or months um, start seeing some some new obstacles city approved and uh, well designed well maintained well constructed uh, obstacles out at the skate park that's all I have thank you Jared any questions for the attorney and just to affirm and maybe it was said and I missed it, but um, Spotswood is scheduled to close on October 12th and all, all systems moving forward. Yes, as far as I know, that's all set to go. Um, it's on Jim's calendar for him to go sign at the closing, so uh, that should be taken care of by Tuesday afternoon. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, next. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Spotswood in particular, the Rah Rah building. Yes, yes. That's, the, that's the what update we're is about Spotswood. Yes, right, just, yes. The Piavano building Piavano on Spotswood building, right. is uh, scheduled for sale to Ra Ra on the twelfth. Yes. yes, clarify. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, new business. Uh, we have the historic marker at uh, Liberty Downing Middle School, and um, there was information in your agenda, and I'd like to call on Miss Alexander um, to as a. Uh, representative of uh, Liberty Downing alumni and uh, of the neighborhood to uh, uh, brief council. So when this uh, project was um, brought forward, I was asked to find out from the community um, how people wanted to recognize the marker. Did they want to recognize the marker with an installation in, in the fall, or would some other plan be uh, more appropriate? 
So I just kind of threw it out there to those people who probably had the, a very vested interest in Lilburn Downing. And those were members of the Lilburn Downing Alumni Association, which had been in existence for a number of years, um, who brought hundreds and hundreds of people to the area, uh, many times for reunions of the alums. And I also listed it on the Lilburn Downing uh, page that on Facebook that uh, Professor Delaney uh, set up, and then he left me to, <laughs> to take care of this page for him. And um, I did get some feedback, not a lot, but I got feedback from all of the um, <clears throat> uh, co uh, committee members who still are living. And they felt that if there is an idea brought forward, then they would go, go along with it because it really didn't matter to them. The only concern that some of them had, because most of them are elderly, um, the concern that they had was COVID right now. And this was when um, uh, this new variant was fast and furious about a month or so ago that they didn't feel like there would be much participation, many people would not come out, and the weather would be unpredictable. So someone uh, suggested to me that, um, who I'm working with actually on planning Juneteenth in 2022 in Richardson Park rather than downtown. So we started talking about the possibilities of doing something um, on, at June, on Juneteenth in conjunction with installation of the marker and dedicating it at that time. And going back to the um, members of L LDAA, they were very interested in that and thought it was a great idea. And basically, I just went back to the, the city manager to report that. And um, so, I just wanted to, you know, make it clear that those people who developed the historic room uh, over in the community center and um, did a lot of work over the years in preserving the Lilburn Downing history from its origins, that I wanted them to have the first shot at letting us, letting the rest of the community know what their preferences were. And seemingly the interest in doing it in conjunction with Juneteenth was um, something that they seemed to be very interested in and hoping that COVID would be over by then and hoping that the weather would be better than the unpredictable weather of the fall. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. And October certainly has been unpredictably warm so far uh, to be sure. Um, you have the report from Ms. Alexander and also the city manager's report, and I'd welcome council's consideration. So just to clarify, kind of a, kind of a, a, a the sense of some of the alumni uh, was that, that there's a preference for the dedication to occur Juneteenth. Does that also, though, include, because sometimes there's an installation at a different time, and, and if you did an installation during the the school year, sooner rather than later, kids are in session, the current students of Lilburn Downing are able to incorporate that into their lessons and their, in the school day, and Mr. Wilson, who assisted, uh, can, can, there, there's an educational aspect of it. So are we, are we just considering not installing it and doing the installation and the dedication at Juneteenth, or installing it now and then the dedication? Yeah, in yeah that was discussed also. Um, and there was still the preference to just do it all in June. Um, uh, someone did speak up and say that if it, it were to be installed now, it should probably stay covered. And I said, well, I'm just not sure that that would stay covered, <laughs> um, considering how teenagers and everybody <laughs> will want to mess with it. So. You know, I guess there's room for compromise out there, but um, I'm just conveying what their wishes were. So, 
certainly from my perspective, as I noted in my uh, briefing, this is not an administrative decision. If it's the will of the council and the community that it be installed also next uh, June, uh, staff has no problem with that. I had heard others say, try and get it out sooner. It was more of a compromise on my part to say, you know, some people um, want to see it today, now, and we can still celebrate it in, Ju uh, in Juneteenth or during the celebration. But if that's not the will of council, that's not a problem for staff or myself to obviously install it end of May, 1st of June, like it's June 22nd. So is it Juneteenth? No, I'm not sure when Juneteenth is right off the top of my head. But 19th. Well, 19th. 19th, okay, 19th. So I mean, I think it's exciting that, we're ha that we have this marker and, and would not, want to uh, cause people discomfort or, or even have our decision criticized of when we installed it. You know, I, I don't want to do something wrong by us making the wrong recommendation uh, because that's not the intent. I mean, this is a, it's a good thing. This is only a good thing to draw attention to an important uh, person, an important school, an important location in the city of Lexington. And the fact that we're trying to decide <laughs> when we can inform the public of this important person, whether we want to do it sooner or wait six or eight months, uh, I usually err on the side of educate, transparency, celebrate when you can. Uh, be, you know, and, and there's nothing that would preclude us from celebrating it formally at Juneteenth. But uh, that, that's just kind of my, my perception because I would love for my kid personally, who's an eighth grader in this building, while she's an eighth grader, to go out there, look at the sign, and have Mr. Wilson, or have some representatives from the community that are alumni, not the whole community, I understand, but, but to, to, to understand where they are and, and what's important here. That, that's just kind of where I, but I, I wonder if it would be possible to install around the very end of the school year and only have it up for what, a week or so? Um, but this will probably wanna be one of those years that they'll probably wanna close in May, I don't know. Um, but that could be a possibility uh, that would make everybody happy. Um, if not, then perhaps we could um, advertise it well enough that students could participate and come back for it. And, and I think they would. I, I think some kids will be back and, and celebrate Juneteenth, but I do personally like that that concept, that compromise. I just I just don't want to miss the opportunity to have a captive audience of the current inhabitants of this school to learn something about their school and about Lilburn Down. You know, I, I just feel like that's pretty important. Um, that, that's uh, again, it's only my opinion. I haven't taken the temperature of the alumni you have, and, and obviously I feel like their opinion trumps mine, but that's just me looking at it from, from. Well, that's a pretty tough fruit. Um, the temperature is usually pretty high, <laughs> um, but I, I will take the heat. Um, and I think it's important to rise to the occasion to consider our students as well as the, the alums and um, do something that makes everybody uh, have an opportunity to participate and res do something respectfully. Ms. Strong? Yeah, I can see both sides to it. And I, I sort of look at it like a business. If you have a soft opening and then the, the real grand opening, and you might just ask them if they'd be amenable to that just because I, I, I just hate the idea of keeping it out, in, you know, the maintenance storeroom until... Juneteenth, June 19th, but we can, um, but again, I'm not, I don't have as vested of an interest as the alumni do, but it might be a suggestion worth mentioning that we can truly have the grand opening on June 19th, but go ahead and set it up. But if they, that spoils it for them, I kind of, I do understand that. Mr. Smith, when, when is the, um, the marker being delivered to the city? Do we have it yet? We do have it. Okay. Um, one thought would be to have it on display inside the building or over the community center before installation right. and then dedication. Um, so one, it's not hidden, but it is not, I guess, more or less public yet. 
and use that as an opportunity for for education and uh, celebration. Possibly, you know, place it in the heritage room and um, have students, you know, visit there, and and Mr. Wilson could add the historic value of it and put, make it part of his curriculum, and and then we install it officially outside in in June. Sounds like they would agree to that. Appease all uh, constituents. Um, you had mentioned Maryland perhaps like the last week of school. I'm not sure exactly when that is at this point, but perhaps that could be. Uh, so it, be, be in the school um, now until the last week of school and then be um, installed in preparation for Juneteenth, if that like rather than bringing it over here now, bring it over at the end of the school year or what, to make it part of the end of the school year activities inside the building okay. and then install for Juneteenth. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. I have no problem with that. Okay. I certainly support that. And it's not difficult to install a pedestal uh, and then install the marker itself. Uh, later, but having it on display now uh, for discussion and observation sounds like a great thing. I may accept that as a motion by Ms. Alexander and a second by Mr. Alligood and uh, welcome any discussion. Just to be clear, I want to make sure I understand this, that, that it would in the very new future go on display in the Heritage room, or are we saying it's not going anywhere? It's staying in storage until the end of the school year. The end of the school year, and I believe that's around the same time that Mr. Wilson um, does a lot in his curriculum about this neighborhood okay. and about the, the history of the school. So it would play right into what he does. It's like maybe the week or two before the end of school. Right. and um, have it in the heritage room and then not bring it out until there's a formal dedication on Juneteenth. Is that uh, okay. what you agree to? Well, well I, I mean, that I, 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 Leslie's point about having it sit now when it is, it is a resource that, that people would benefit from, I, I, to me, like, I, I, I'd like it to be somewhere than it, other than in storage until the end of the school year. That seems like a long way to go with having it just in storage. I, but but I, I will agree with, with whatever. Um. So the, the uh, storage can be on display in the heritage room. Would, would that be okay? And, and, and then, I mean, it could be installed, you know, in, in early June or in, in June and, and then for Juneteenth. But at least the public could see it if they if they wanted, and that would be a reason to, to visit the heritage room and um, I'll accept the friendly amendment to do that, but when I take the heat, I'm calling you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Mr. Smith. I hate to drag this out, but Talking about toward the end of the school year curriculum, it could be moved from the heritage room into the Lilburn Downing building for the entire student body to see and not just the um, Eric Wilson eighth graders. Um, just, just a thought. I'm, I'm, I'm picking nits and <laughs> whatever you all want to do is, is, is fine. But right, I, I mean, I think putting it in the heritage room and then letting who who would be the appropriate folks to decide. I mean, I mean, at, at that stage, as long as it's publicly viewable, it, it, it's of no consequence to to me or city council. I would think whether it's you know in the heritage room or here, and then that would be somebody else's decision. I would feel better by being in the heritage room because it's locked quite a bit until somebody okay. wants to come see it. Um, this is more public, it's more use, and I would be concerned. I have a motion and a second, a friendly amendment, I think. 
And if I can trouble you to articulate your motion. I move to uh, have the Lilburn Downing historic marker placed in the heritage room of the community center um, at the convenience of public works so that the students can uh, use it for historic value in the curriculum and then uh, bring it to the exterior of the building on Juneteenth to um, install permanently as well as have a dedication. Sick. I have a motion and a second. Thank you all very much. And I would ask uh, any further discussion. Uh, hearing none, roll call vote. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Sigler? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Alligood? Aye. Ms. Strawn? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Exciting time to mark your calendar for June 19th and the celebration in Richardson Park and at Liburn Downing. Uh, next item of business is a closed meeting. We have two of them uh, before um, Ms. Alexander reads us into the closed session. I will uh, alert everyone that we do not anticipate taking any action. It's for uh, briefings from staff uh, regarding the VDOT property and uh, also a potential legal matter. A move that Lexington City Council convene in closed meeting in accordance with section 2.2-3711, subsection A, paragraph 3 of the Code of Virginia, a closed session for the purpose of discussing the acquisition of real estate for a public purpose. In addition, Lexington City Council will convene in a closed meeting in accordance with section 2.2-3711, subsection A, paragraph 8 of the Code of Virginia, a closed session for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice. Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. It's been moved and second. Um, Ms. Strawn? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Sigler? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Allegood? Aye. And I vote aye. 